I'm just a tape. <laughs> but it's not a lecture, performance. Uh, in fact, what we have been researching is online creative collaboration. Uh, and to do so, mm. we chose to, to work on a specific theme. And this time it was gestures and ornaments, but it could have been literally anything. Uh, but the overall idea for this is how, what it is like to collaborate creatively when you're in different countries or different cities and uh, online. How that works, whether it works. Yeah, and with that in mind, because we um, wanted to be pretty specific about how we designed our process of collaboration, um, we had kind of a concern about how the kind of like threat of the final presentation was going to affect um, our collaboration, and particularly in the different kinds of ways we might censor ourselves or allow ourselves to express ourselves within the collaborative process. Um, so we decided to, in this presentation, um, not necessarily speak our own words, but also sometimes speak each other's words. So we've written out a lot of what we want to say already, and we've distributed kind of speaking roles. Um, so this was in the interest of kind of like not feeling that we had to be each personally accountable for what we had to, for what we were contributing, but also allowing for kind of the differences between us to be retained. So it's kind of an experiment. So we see how it goes. <coughs> yes. My name is Hege, I come from Norway. I'm a part of the doc, but in the circus, not much in contemporary circus practices. What I normally research is weather phenomena, emotions, and uh, senses in my circus work, and how I can also challenge my uh, relationship with the audience. I'm Lanai, I come from Greece. I study at Utrecht University in media and performance, and my main research interests are early cinema, early modern dance, uh, the agency between technology uh, in dance performances, and motion documentation. Yeah, my name is Sebastian Kahn, I come from the States. Um, I'm interested, I'm researching circus and dance dramaturgy at Utrecht University, and I'm, yeah, my interests are quite broad at the moment, but basically revolve around imagination, freedom, and embodiment. So I'm sure that many here will agree that there's lots of creative ideas and that want to collaborate in the art scene, um, whether that's dance, circus, performance art, etc. but it's hard to secure money to meet up and make it happen. So part of wanting to research what it's like to collaborate online was to see if this is a realistic way to go through a creative process, what difficulties might be in terms of technology, if it makes a difference seeing something on a screen versus real life, whether trying out or performing on screen increases or decreases, the pressure it is to have someone watch you, to give feedback, and so on and so on. So in this particular situation, we only had one body involved in circus practice, which for obvious reasons made the parameters kind of like easier or lighter. Um, so I was in Studio 16 here at Doc, whereas the others met me on Skype from the Netherlands. And funnily enough, Seb and then I live in different cities in the Netherlands, but we couldn't figure out how to make Skype work three ways in an efficient way. Go figure, right? So, um, so Seb and then I ended up commuting between cities to be together on the other side of Skype while I was here in Sweden. Um, so our research here is about uh, online collaboration, we needed to choose a starting point from which to catalyze our research. And we're going to walk you now through the process of how this grew. During our first joint Skype meeting, I met Hege for the first time, and I was introduced to the type of circus that she performs. Later on, Sebastian explained uh, his theoretical approach to circus performance. After learning about their research interests, I realized that I couldn't really identify the grid with them or find a common subject. And for this reason, Hege suggested that we would start from my interests. My immediate answer was gestures. My research interests on gestures has started with the examination of gestures into early cinema films where gestures are the main medium of communication. The gestures that I'm interested in are not the natural or ordinary gestures that are employed during the speech. The type of gestures that I'm more interested in are the ones that are the visible bodily actions that can serve as the alternative for spoken words. The type of gesture that could convey a meaning, or to sum up, a standalone gesture that does not serve some other function, for example, finding the road. The gestures that do not have, an, and also not the gestures that have an ornamental character. We began by watching and analyzing videos of Hayes' performance, uh, watching for gesture and trying to track choreographic structure. We decided to analyze this video, which is an act of hers of 2008. It's a very lyrical, very beautiful, uh, in a kind of a dramatic way. And I was interested in this one in particular, rather than a video that is that would represent her work right now, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it seemed more like typical contemporary circles. For that reason, a gestural and structural approach 
wear this dustbin and not me, so to speak. I'm suspicious of this drive uh, towards the future in performance and art practices in general, of always having to reinvent oneself to demonstrate quote unquote growth. Um, it seems to require some intense energy investment at the same time a certain kind of wastefulness, right? So, um, our question was why must things go out of style the moment they're performed? Um, so in the interest of discovering new and more sustainable artistic uh, ecologies, I pushed to use this sort of dated material and basically to recycle it into something that's still valuable in the contemporary. So the question was, rather than just throwing this away totally, what can we use from it? Um, how can the path become a cumulative support structure rather than a sort of old skin that we uh, must constantly struggle to separate from? So, in my work, this is my from 2008 when I was doing my bachelor uh, in London, uh, I really thought that I had no <coughs> gestures whatsoever. Everything I do is purely because I need to do it. And how I see my style of movement Scandinavian um, style, where my um, my focus is sort of like to float around, and sometimes I work with the image of being a jellyfish of like a shooting woman. Um, but in fact, this floating style is a gesture in itself, which I have never even considered. Uh, and starting to consider that, and looking at my work from two, two thousand eight and up until now, I realize that everything I do is. Yeah, so as we continued, I kept on trying to understand my gestures and what a gesture could be. And we talked about gestures being something that are essentially not necessary. Um, it was also into this conversation that we talked about the fact that even all the tricks and climbs are gestures in and of themselves. Because uh, on one level, climbing a rope to do tricks and performances isn't actually necessary. So I was confused. But being confused is a good state to be in, in my opinion. Um, it means I believed something, had a question or challenge somehow, and now I'm on my way of learning something new. But before I really understand this new, I'm confused. If everything I do is gestures, are there many levels or layers of gestures? Is there a difference, is there a difference between a gesture and an ornamental move? What is necessary and what is extra? Honestly, I'm not sure what anything is anymore, but I feel like I've learned something about my work. I'm just not sure exactly what it is that I have learned. Um, after closely examining Hege's older video, I realized there weren't many gestures in her performance. Her hands were constantly holding the rope, so I couldn't locate any primary gestures, so like alternatives to spoken word. And her legs were always moving as part of these circus tricks. So the question, what can be considered a circus gesture, surfaced. Um, the only element that I was able to translate as a gesture was the gaze. And it appears that the main reason that the absence of primary gestures in the act is the nature of the rope technique, right? So a performer has to hold the rope, but even when she does this, the gestures are either kind of functional or ornamental. Um, so the real question was, could there be primary gestures in rope technique? And if there are, are they always connected to a sort of narrative, and are they always meant to portray meaning? We asked Hege to employ meaningful gestures and play with the moment she addressed the audience. During this experiment, Hege exaggerated with her gestures and tried to make as many as possible, though it was difficult leaving the role. However, a certain blurriness occurred by the multiple movement, and it was not clear especially to me when was the start of the trick, of the climb, and of the gesture. In order to handle the role, Hege performs hand gestures, so there was great difficulty distinguishing the trick from the gesture. The moment you thought you were watching a gesture, a few seconds later you realized that it was a functional gesture for the trick. So when Hege got off the ball, we explained to her that we couldn't really distinguish her movements. For this reason, she tried to explain what part of this was gesture by moving her hands. And that was the moment where we realized that a circus gesture could be the marking of the movement, so we asked her to repeat them on the ground so that she could later employ them on the road. Um, yeah, so the so, what, what she's doing, I feel like I'm talking about her, like she's not here. <laughs> what she was doing just then, right, is, the, is like marking through her routine. So, re kind of representing your legs with your arms? Yes. Ish. Sometimes legs, yeah. sometimes arms, arms, sometimes legs are, or arms are legs. Yeah. yeah. So then, um, 
So then what we thought uh, the next thing that we could do would be to, um, if you like lock in at a fixed height, um, and then you try to use some, like, some of those gestures that you found on the ground as inspiration uh, to make gestures happen on the road. This is, by the way, if I can say a tiny word now, uh, something for now I will do straight away. That took me like a few hours to really understand what the heck you were trying to make me do. Yeah. Like for real. And if you could like repeat, as you try a gesture, could you try repeating like three or four times just so it's clear? Because sometimes it's hard to see through the screen. Yeah, so after I break through my sequence on the floor for them, which was a normal thing for me to do before going on stage, uh, we decided to try to find a way to be as clear as that in the road. So instead of going through a whole sequence, I got myself into a locked position, and from there we tried to add gestures that were only gestures and not part of any trick um, or movement. So while Hege was trying to improvise her hand gestures, it became clear that we were entering uncharted territory. And um, this was a turning point in our research, as it seems also that we were asking her to dance in a certain way, um, and then to perform the rope technique as kind of separate thing. So for this reason, we, we asked her to concentrate more on the gestures that she usually does during her act. Like, can you try to think of like what is, you know what I mean? Can you try to think of what gestures are already there? Like maybe the floatiness that you have already? You want to try yeah. and you can show what the floatiness yeah. what I thought was nothing is yeah. you think is a gesture. But can you try it without without leaving your box Yeah, I can just sit there. So normally if I would sit in this position and when I do something, I automatically end here. Because for me this is sort of like a in water in a space float. The fact that I hold my arms makes them look lighter, even if this is actually easy for me to do. But here, I get this sense of floating. And I didn't really realize, but I automatically also do this tiny, tiny, tiny movements with my fingers very often. And when I have these moments of stillness, this is also where I tend to look out at the audience to emphasize the floatiness. And this is the style that she described at the beginning of neutral, which was <laughs> <laughs> <which is> funny. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of content in there. Yeah. But in fact, I guess neutral would be. Yeah. And my form of neutral is very <laughs> held and specific to me, I guess, even though it's not like, oh no, but it's just what I do. <laughs> it's how I naturally. <laughs> Megan, like, do you want to come closer to the screen so we can talk about what you just did? Yeah, come down here. Alternate and temporality of online collaborations. 
I do things. Um, it's called Peacemaker to Go. It was developed by the uh, Motion Bank, which is an initiative from the Foresight Company. And um, basically, it, it allows you to annotate a video file. Um, but not only just placing points, but placing kind of like durations. So depending on what you decide to tag, um, you decide to tag, like for example, this tag, which is when we're emphasizing horizontal space. We see that she was doing this from 6 minutes 41 to 6 minutes 48, and it prints out a corresponding bar in that color along the timeline. So you end up being able to kind of like, um, like sort of extract these like uh, formal uh, things, depending on what you decide your different tags are going to be. Um, and it turned out it seems like this is not really what the program is made for. Like it seems like it's actually more made for archiving. So like if you're generating a lot, a lot of material, you just put a couple tags in so you can like refer back to it later. Um, but we were interested in trying to make it work in this in this uh, structural way. And so a couple things that we um, discovered. So this red line, this is uh, modes of address, or it's times when it feels like she's. Uh, addressing us as an audience, either through her gaze or through kind of like framing an image as something that it's like, stop and look at this now, or through having a kind of connection with the rope where what we see is the relation as something that's being like highlighted. Um, and as you can see, like all of these times when she's uh, engaging in a dress, it's like punctuation. It's not like something that is ever in an extended duration. Um, and similarly, this, the blue is directionality, so it's when she's changing heights. So you can see that she changes heights for short amounts of time, never like suspended and s suspended and slow, but like it's always like fast up, fast down, and she gets to a place and she does something, or she gets to somewhere else and she does something. Um, but in contrast to green bars here, so these are like uh, presences, different things that are present on stage. So the body is something that's present throughout, as well as light is present throughout. And then these other different elements add in kind of like a crescendo. Like we have first music, and then voice, um, and I can't remember what the other ones are for the moment. But so you see that the sort of elements come in this almost a way that uh, encourages a kind of narrativity, because we um, reach a sort of climax. Um, so what we're interested in doing uh, now was trying something, because we did this and then we got distracted never actually like put this into practice so we thought that we could try now something that we haven't done before to also give you like a little bit of an insight into our working dynamic. I was sad to say that earlier they have been like oh yeah and that's what we do this so I have no <laughs> idea what they're gonna make me do they know what I don't do. <laughs> try like for example if you're addressing outward to do it for more than like because you do it max four seconds or something usually. Oh, yeah. Try to yeah hold the point. Or like for example also including images or movements that last more than four seconds. Because you know you kind of like hold stuff long enough for people to clap and then it's like okay time to leave. Mm -hmm. But like maybe it's well, interesting. Almost, like, awkwardly, awkwardly yeah. Done. Just to see what happens.
when I just look at the audience normally for like one second or whatever you have come to the audience and you're like yeah. yeah the sort of that floatiness feels you know it's just there but now when you point it out it became very obvious for me that this state of floatiness sort of loses its um, almost like function or idea a little bit so then maybe it started mm -hmm. to actually but it was hard, harder to hold the body to like people that do physical stuff you know that in a particular position to relax the body is much harder to actually do it it's like climbing really slow which sounds like oh but that's like a treat the worst and um, so it was like that it's like yeah it's made it harder and also like i really like taking in audience and looking at them but it's like in my mind i'm like seen you all three times now and because I think in my head when I do things I have a sort of narrative of thoughts like this feels comfortable, I float, I take you in, I continue and it becomes like a constant flow but now it's so long that it just becomes like my own narration disappears. Yeah, I think you wanted also, I, though, I, wanted I, saw, that, I saw that you wanted to, to make a dress always now with your eyes. But yeah. I think that I think that it maybe yeah. would have been not not easier, but also maybe more interesting if sometimes the address is just the image without you explicitly. Yeah, true, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He has no idea yeah. every time I do it with the eyes. Yeah, I wonder if it makes a difference then to to watch because when I look at him, it's actually nicer to not be scared at all. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you don't always need to be nice. Also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
normally reduce throat performance with the feedback and both only climbing and sliding. So that's what Hegg is going to perform. So we'll try to just climb up, climb down in different dynamics, rhythms, levels. Hege, is the task clear? Uh, second to bottom, yeah. Come in. You can come in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, just the important thing to keep in mind is if we're composing with, if we're composing with the same repeated thing, then what's interesting is like the the whole composition and the way things vary over the course of the whole composition. So really try to think about also planning knowing what you've just done, how what you could do next related to what you've just done. Does that make sense? That would be a little... No, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, we have done this before, you know, I mean, yeah. like, directions every time. But uh, I'll go, and then you tell me what you think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The music also is making it very dramatic, but I think it's also the way you're looking at the room, maybe. Yeah. Just so we can see the form better. For the, I mean, we can add whatever later.
Yeah, so we were beginning to find something that we felt like was kind of amenable to this program or that the program would be like well suited to interacting with because it's like a pretty clear, like it would be very, very easy to translate this into the sort of format that the, sorry, I'm just going to put the light on. The sort of format that the program, for the interface of the program. But then the next step for us was to try to make it a little bit more complex, right? So like, in the interest of also being able to kind of deploy the rest of what happens in rogue technique. Um, Do you want me to, um, to the musical? Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so our idea then was to, like, we were like, what happens if she adds also one movement that she can kind of distribute? Along with this climbing and falling, what happens if, okay, now we introduce just one movement, and that becomes part of her kind of uh, toolbox of things that she can use to make a formal composition? And she, like, <laughs> it was so hard to, it was so hard to find one movement on rope because of the nature of rope, like the technique aggr uh, gets, the complexity aggregates really quickly. So, do you want to show us what you, do you need to take a break or you can no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so the one move that I chose, the lady she asked me, pick one very simple move so we can add things onto it. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are so simple. <laughs> but you know when you're in a world of something, you don't think of it as, suggested and that we work with uh, turned out is I, I thought it was going to be in two moves. Uh, going upside down, coming back. That's sort of the nature of the time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is what we're going down to, yeah? <laughs> I'm with a little bit tired now. So, the climb starts like this. I, I do the short dance because I'm the big so I lift to engage and go on one side and roll. I lift one leg in my style, straight in the other, leg on, let go of the hand, look down, uh, fling it out, as I always do that, over the leg, grab it, let go, up, grab, fling, grab, grab. That was my one move. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it took about half a second before they were on me. Uh, <laughs> like literally everything I did, I had to rethink, which was good. I'm not saying this was a critique at all. Um, so yeah, that one move turned out to be many moves. And in fact, all those moves in themselves, I realized, are gestures, which means that everything, again, that I do are actually gestures. Can you show us one more time, like breaking it down? Show it in one go, is that okay, Zell? Yeah, please do. Um, the reason why I think of that as maybe not one move but two moves, so this is how I think normally. Okay, so I'm starting here and I think, well, let's go. So, upside down, one move. Ways of working become more important than 
material ones. That is to say, contemporary workers remain materially embedded, but their field of activity is conceptualized as primarily communicative. Think service industries, administration and bureaucracy, marketing and etc., as opposed to agricultural, industrial, or other kinds of minor trade things. Such a system values material transparency. The content of the message, whether it is any directives of a hotel employee, the internal memo of the corporate worker, or the promise of a certain lifestyle embodied in an advertisement, should appear clearly. The material negation of the message disappearing without creating ambiguity or asserting of the profession. So for instance, like the materiality of the Coca-Cola advertisement and the strategies that play in the staging and the conventions, um, are secondary to and appear essentially unbound from the world that the advertisement proposes, which is a world in which Coca-Cola is everything that it says it is. Refreshing, satisfying, related to having a good time, et cetera, et cetera. So our instinct to communicate clearly and to subordinate material to discourse has to do with being trained to be good workers. The conceptual separation of form and content in contemporary circles is bound up with the perceptual systems of late capital. There is a tendency in contemporary circles to see movement which deviates from that which is conventionally necessary to complete, to complete the trick, uh, as extra or ornamental. The appellization of rogue technique that privileges compact, uh, compact acrobatic units over more diffuse movement research fits, fits into a general tendency to strip down or essentialize circus technique. This tendency, stage gesture, and movement quality as something extra, as an ornament. We are used to looking through the cultural objects which surround us, to cutting straight to the content of media. And we are likewise trained to produce cultural objects which communicate efficiently. Yeah, so um, do you want to show how it looked like when we added the gestures? Um, or do you need, yeah. if you need more time to breathe, we can also keep talking. Well, I guess. Yeah? So this is the one where I literally do a short sequence that I've been doing here, and yeah. I don't add yeah. one minute. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, we, we forgot to write this, but I think it's just important to bring back the, the video from the beginning, where she had all of this kind of like ornamental um, dramatic. dramatic stuff. And there's kind of this tendency that's seen in contemporary circuits that's seen as progressive, to strip this away and go to an essential. But what we're also interested in showing is how we can bring back this ornament, maybe apart from its original function, but highlighting the way the tendency to strip away and to strip back what's seen as superficial somehow generates a split between form and content. Okay. This is maybe one of the stuff Hey, we're thinking down here if you think about um, if you maybe when you're doing the things that you think about as like technical bundles because you're, you're still kind of bundling the technique and then putting a gesture after you're finished somehow uh -huh. but if you think about stopping
something in the middle of what you consider one movement. You, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that maybe that's a helpful way, because maybe you don't have to break down every bundle into all of its component parts, but if you try to find places to stop in, in the middle, then maybe we get more of a, yeah? And remind me of like ornaments, like complete unnecessaries, you talked about marking body parts, can you just give me a hint? Yeah, highlighting like your name, your oh, eyes, yeah. or your feet that are so. Okay. Okay. So basically we tried to reapply the ornamental movements which had been removed from Hegel's repertoire. And we were pushing in this way towards a flatter dramaturgy. Um, once ornament became formal rather than referential, or self uh, yeah, formal rather than referential, the difference between the trick and its ornamentation began to blur. Like what is really a necessary movement on the road, right? Because as we're beginning on the ground and ending in the same spot, we can't really speak of functional necessity. Or if we can, the function is the making present of forms. Um, so all forms in this uh, paradigm appear on the table, so to speak. Um, particularly if we broke tricks down into their component parts, they appear themselves nothing more than bundles of gestures, grouped by convention, but decomposable, and ultimately self -reference. So in closing, some words about digital collaboration and the conditions of production in which it might be useful. Um, Stockholm, Amsterdam, and even Utrecht are cities in which spaces and our right to occupy them dictate the underlying tempo and character of life. Basically, we're witness to a total capitalist organization of space as every square inch of the metropolis is necessarily made profitable, divided into transitional space and useful, reproductive, consumptive space. In the former, you'd better move along, and in the leader, latter, you'd better be frantically generating. Any artist today, and especially uh, any performing artist, is familiar with the imperative to travel. Artistic networks are no longer local. Artists must go where opportunity knocks, for creation, for scoring, and for networking. So, uh, supportive artist communities become these dispersed artistic networks, organized around the individual artistic rather than around what were once called local scenes. Yeah, artisti is a great oh, <laughs> Artistic, maybe. So the quality of connection between artists become thinner, turning collaboration into basically using each other rather than a rich exchange. We meet at festivals, exchange pleasantries, and updated CDs, and move on, hoping to perhaps lay the groundwork for future projects. It is in this context that digital collaboration promises great potential. Because the cost of collaboration is lower, the pressure to produce is less heavy. So now, on the one hand, digital collaboration has the potential to suggest a certain lightness. We don't all have to each, uh, secure permission to access a certain space, uh, space, arrange our schedules to be there, and then actually travel to the place. We can collaborate with whom we want, where we want, without financial investment implying that we work in order to secure a certain return and without needing to leave our local scenes for days or weeks at a time. Of course, thinking along with such analysis as uh, did the less postscript on the societies of control, the despecialization of institutional control that comes along with digital technologies suggests a certain cautious orientation towards practices such as ours. The dark side of digital collaboration is the sense in which it allows us to work and, and to penetrate and, or let's say, hijack our, our life. Because I can be a digital dramaturg anywhere, at any time. I can participate in what Coombs calls the contemporary excess of collaboration, multiplying my projects to diversify my investment portfolio, reducing my commitment to anyone present, so much as to consign collaboration to the realm of pseudo-activity. 
And the question also arose, would a digital dramaturg be worth less than an actually embodied one? Um, uh, does the lightness of the practice devalue the cognitive labor involved? Such questions are certainly worth keeping in mind going forward, if and when this practice becomes part of our professional lives. Now, in the still relatively sheltered context of the university, our experiment felt far from self-promotional or self-exploitative. We emphasized at the beginning that the project would be the process itself, with no particular goal in mind except coming together, exchanging, and experimenting. In terms of this presentation, basically everything was on the table. Um, and we tried to keep the shadow of the moment of performance as light as possible by de-emphasizing authorship. What you just witnessed was actuality and becoming, but with a whole load of virtuality behind it. Virtuality which grew in the space opened up between our relative isolation from life world conditions and a playful experimental subjective orientation. In other words, we presented one thing today, but it very well could have been something else. And this is the lightness promised by the digital collaboration. The lightness of not having to recoup a travel investment in terms of money, but also in terms of time and sociality. What is important to emphasize is that, the light, is that lightness is not inherent to the digital. It is something which needs the pending through the conscientious framing of the process. That's all.
COVID. We'll have to stop for anyone who wants to go to Andrews. Thanks, sorry to interrupt you. Let's talk afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.